Corporate Finance Core, Topic 7, Cost of Capital. Learning Objective Number 2, we're going to estimate the cost of equity using CAPM. Well, historical returns on stock are observable. You know exactly what rate of return your stock had last year. There's no observable or stated future rate of return for stock or equity. There's a standard model called the CAPM. That's the capital asset pricing model. And this model is widely used to get this uh, cost of equity used in a weighted average cost of capital. And this CAPM model relates the required or expected return of a stock to its market risk. So let's talk more about this CAPM model. So uh, this model starts with assumptions. The main assumption for CAPM is investors are diversified in many stocks. Therefore, if you're looking at the required return of any individual stock, well, that depends on the, uh, the, the risk of the stock relative to the entire market. Okay, so again, assume the average investor holds the full market. We'll call that the S&P 500. Uh, and so if you're looking at how will my total risk of my portfolio change by adding this individual stock, I need to look at the sensitivity of the individual stock to the entire market. Now, this measure of how risky the stock is relative to the entire market is called beta. Now, and, and how you calculate beta is you use a regression coefficient or slope uh, when you regress the stock's returns against the market's returns. So again, when we talk about the stock market, we'll just use the S&P 500. So it, it, that simply that covers about 80% of the market value of equities. So it's, it's a pretty good market. So uh, I just took a screenshot from uh, an old screenshot from uh, a Bloomberg screen. And what you see is a graph, a scatter graph, where the y-axis is the excess or the returns of the stock market. And the uh, x-axis is the returns of uh, Walmart. And uh, what you see, I'm sorry, it's, it's returns of uh, uh, the stock market on the x-axis and the returns of Walmart on the right axis and are the, uh, the vertical axis. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to fit a best uh, or get, get a best fit regression line through this data. And through this data, every one of these points would represent on that date over that period of time, what was return of the market and what was the return of Walmart. So we get a best fit line. That best fit regression line, the slope of that line is what we call beta. Now, if beta is equal to one, so the slope is equal to one, that means the stock has the same risk as the market. So uh, if the, say the stock market were up 10% uh, this month and, and the beta is one, you would predict that the stock is up 10%. It has a, roughly the same level of risk as the market. Now, if beta is greater than one, that, mean it has, that means it has a higher slope. Say beta is equal to two. That means when the market's up 10, your stock will tend to be up 20. And if the market's down 10, your stock would tend to be down 20. All right, so beta greater than one means the stock is riskier than the market. Now, if the beta is less than one, that means the stock is less risky than the market. It's safer than the market. So think of a beta of 0.5. 0.5. That means when the market is up 10, you think you're, you'd expect that stock to be up 5, and the market is down 10, that stock would tend to be down 5. So me, the measure, this measure beta is the key to the CAPM model, since it tells you how risky your stock is relative to the market, and the model assumes that most investors are rationally diversified in the market, so they don't care about the total level of risk of the stock, say measured by standard deviation, they just need to have, know how sensitive it is relative to the market. So here's a CAPM formula, the famous CAPM formula. It says the cost of equity, that, that, that KE I need for my WAC formula, is equal to the risk-free rate plus that beta measure times what we call this is the market risk premium, the expected return of the stock market over the risk-free rate. Now, when we say risk-free rate, the proxy I'll always use for this course is going to be the yield on the 10-year treasury bond. So what this model tells you is the cost of equity, the required return 
for buying any individual stock is going to be at least the risk-free rate of return, right? Who would ever buy a risky stock if it doesn't at least give you the risk-free rate of return? So as a base, every risky stock must give you the risk-free rate of return, that's this uh, RF, plus a compensation for market risk. All right, now I say market risk, I'm, what I'm, I'm implicitly talking about is the risk of the stock relative to the market. So how do I get the compensation for taking on market risk for any individual stock? It's the measure of the stock's risk, beta, times the compensation per unit of risk, which we're gonna call the market risk premium or the equity risk premium. And that's the expected return of the stock market minus that same risk-free rate. So just a, as a numerical example, you're looking for the expected return of say Walmart uh, and the current treasury rates are say 2%. So Walmart better give you a 2% rate of return because of the, uh, which is the risk-free rate of return, plus some compensation for risk. Now, what if Walmart had a beta of 1.0 and the expected return of the stock market minus the risk-free rate, well, I'll just put in some numbers, say it's a uh, 8% and the same 2% as here. So what this would tell you is uh, for this stock, you better get 2% rate of return plus one times 6%. So this model tells you, uh, since this firm has average risk, has a beta of one, it's gonna give you the compensation per unit of risk is the market risk premium. It's gonna give you eight minus two. So I'll just take one times eight minus two. Now, if Walmart had a beta of 0.5, it would be two plus half of six, which is three, and I'd have 5%. So this model is saying that depending on the beta, that's what level of return that you should require for the risk of that stock, where that risk is measured by beta. Now, how do I get this market risk premium? This RM minus RF is the expected return of the market over the treasury bond rate. And what we'll generally use is historical data for that. And that's what I wanna talk about on this slide. Uh, if you go to your spreadsheet, I'm not gonna do it now, you'll see from 1926 to 2015, I believe, what was the return of large cap stocks, which is roughly the S&P 500 by year. And here's what is the return of the treasuries by year. And then this column here that says long-term market risk premium tells you in every year from 1926 to 2015, what was the rate of return of the stock market over the bond rate, the difference between the stock market return and the bond rate of return. And you can see here, let's look at a really bad year. Let's look at the uh, res uh, Great Depression year of 1931. 1931, the stock market was down 41%. And the if you held a long-term bond, you lost 2% that year. So the stock market return was 41% below the bond rate. However, if I look two years later in 1933, the stock market was up 53% in 1933. Bonds only gave you 2%, so you got an extra 51% risk premium or excess returns uh, for investing in the stock market la la that year. Now, over that long period of time, that was at a 90-year period or so, the stock market has averaged 6% return over the bond market. So often, I will use in my examples, if I go back to this CAPM model, I will use 6% as the market risk premium. So I won't even look at RM minus RF. I'll just say that I think the market risk premium is gonna be close to the historical average of 6%. So all I need to do is plug in the beta to get the cost of equity. In uh, reality, no one really knows what the future expected return on the stock market over the bond market is. So often we see estimates between four and 8% as the market risk premium. So uh, I now want to use uh, some data on Walmart's return and the stock market return uh, and calculate the beta for ourselves just to get an idea how it's done. So I have data from uh, 2019 going back uh, to 2014 for Walmart. 
I then uh, calculated the monthly returns of Walmart and the monthly returns of the S&P 500. And what I want to do is use that data to calculate, or first of all, I'm going to graph the data and then fit that best fit line, that regression line, and get the slope of that line to see from 2014 to 2019 what was the beta for Walmart. So I'm going to go to the data set, click on regression beta. Here are again in column B are the prices of the S&P 500, column C prices of Walmart, column D is the returns of the S&P 500 and then E is the returns of Walmart. Uh, I'm just going to select this whole area. I'm going to click on that, hold my shift down, go to the right, and then I'm going to go to the bottom of this series. Actually, I'll just drag it down, go to the bottom of the series. I'm going to go back up now because I want to insert a graph. So I've selected that data. I want to insert chart XY scatter. So there's my chart. So what this shows me in this chart is my Y axis is my returns of Walmart. My X axis are the returns of the S&P 500. Each one of these dots is a month. So on this dot right here, I'm clicking on one of the dots here. On that dot, looks like the Walmart return was about 11% and the stock market looks like it was only about 1%. So, uh, uh, so actually there's the data right there. Walmart's return was 11% and the uh, stock market was a little bit above zero. So if I do try to fit a best fit line, a couple ways to do that, you can just do it graphically. Just do a right click on the, uh, or click on one of the data points, right click and click on add trend line with my left mouse button. I'm then uh, going to keep this, it says linear and I want to click on display equation, display R squared, and then I'll get rid of that, close that out. So now I have a trend line or a regression line. The slope of that line, well, it gives you the equation of the line, y equals 0.3439x plus 0.0065. So the uh, regression or the uh, slope coefficient 0.3439 that would be the beta from 2014 to 2019 of Walmart. The other way to do that, if you don't want to do it graphically, is you can use Excel's slope function equals slope. I'm going to put in the S&P 500 returns, comma, Walmart returns, control shift down. Whoops, I got those in the wrong order. Notice how it says slope Walmart returns my y-axis and S&P. So let me do that again. Equals slope. My known y's are Walmart's return, control shift down, comma, S&P 500, control shift down to get to the bottom. I'm going to close that. And there's my 0.34. Let me add another decimal place. There's my 0.3439 I saw from there. And now let's calculate the regression R squared equal RSQ. And then go ahead and put the Walmart returns, comma, S&P 500 returns again. And the R squared is 5%, which is also here. So not a great statistic. That says that the uh, uh, only 5% of the returns of at Walmart are explained by the variation in the stock market or the S&P 500. However, you do get a beta estimate of 0.3439. Now I can then use that beta along with my historical market risk premium to calculate uh, what would be the expected return of stock market. I'm sorry, expected return of Walmart. So down here at the bottom of the slide, the cost of equity for Walmart would be the treasury rate on the day I did this analysis. The treasury rates uh, were 1.95% for 10 year treasuries. So that's my risk free rate. There's my beta 0.344. And then I'm going to use the long term market risk premium of 6.16. So that would tell me for shareholders in Walmart, which is a very safe stock, it only has 0.34 beta. In other words, if the stock market is down 10, Walmart's only down 3.4%. So you should only demand a 4% return for Walmart.
based on this model. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this uh, CAPM model and beta and maybe another way of calculating beta. So what tries a beta? So why should a stock be more volatile to the, up to the market or less volatile to the market? Well, a couple things. Uh, why is a stock more sensitive to the market? One would be cyclicality of revenues. Say you have a stock that's very cyclical in sales. So these are tend to be, say, luxury goods or large ticket items. You know, something is very expensive and a luxury, something you don't really need, but you like. All right, so this might be uh, caviar or, or gold jewelry. So uh, in that case, you would think that that stock would be riskier when the market's up, that stock's even up more. But when the stock stock's down, that stock, oh, I'm sorry, when the market is down, that stock's even more down. So companies that had luxury goods or big ticket item goods you don't necessarily have to buy, would have maybe a low beta. I'm sorry, a high beta, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, stocks that would have luxury goods and, and large ticket item of goods that you could maybe not buy if the market uh, turns down, you expect those stocks would have uh, a, 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 a high beta. All right, meaning that they're, they're more volatile. Uh, another one is operating leverage. So firms that have a lot of fixed cost in production will do really well when sales are booming because some a lot of their co production costs are fixed. So, uh, so operating leverage is going to affect beta. And the last one is financial leverage. Companies with lots of debt, when times are bad, are going to do even worse because they have all these fixed payments that are due and they might go bankrupt. So cyclicality operating leverage, fixed cost in production, and financial leverage, fixed cost uh, in uh, financing, are drivers of beta. So let's think about Walmart for a minute. What if Walmart had no debt or twice its debt level? What do we think would happen to beta? So if Walmart had no debt, the question is, do you think it would be less volatile or more volatile? Well, it's pretty obvious it should be less volatile if it had zero debt. So uh, we want to try to figure out a way of adjusting betas if you thought about Walmart wanted to maybe eliminate all its debt or maybe double the value of its debt. So un unlevered betas, so these are betas where you start with the levered beta, you know, the, the regression beta. I'll call this beta here the, uh, that we calculated in the last slide, I'll call it the regression beta uh, or the levered beta. However, if I want to calculate an unlevered beta, that is that would be the, what would happen the beta if it had zero debt. And we're going to use a formula to calculate that. The unlevered beta, the beta with no debt, would be the regression or levered beta divided by 1 plus the DDE ratio, the debt over equity ratio, where D is net debt and E is the market value of stock. So if I uh, round Walmart's beta, equity beta uh, or levered beta or regression beta to 0.35, and I looked up, Walmart has about $66 billion of net debt. And I look at the market value of all of their shares, it's $340 billion. So this is their DDE ratio, 66 over 340. If I take 0.35 divided by 1 over their D, 1 plus their DDE ratio, they'd have a beta of 0.293. So if I want to calculate what would, if Walmart eliminated all its debt, what would its uh, expected return to stockholders be? I'd plug in that beta into the uh, cap M formula. Now we can also answer the question, well, what if Walmart had twice the amount of debt? You know, their DDE ratio was twice as high. Well, I can take, I can rearrange this formula here, solve for levered beta and say the levered beta is the unlevered beta times one plus the DDE ratio. And when I think about the DD ratio, I'm gonna just uh, hypothetically say, what if Walmart's DD ratio was twice as high? Well, I take that unlevered beta of 0.93, I calculate it in the last section, and I'm gonna multiply times one plus two times their DD ratio. So Walmart would have a, a, a beta of 0 0.40 if they had twice their amount of debt or twice their DD ratio. So this is how you can adjust the beta for different levels of debt. And this is very helpful if you calculate a regression beta based on, let's say, the last five years, and you know the company is either eliminating their debt or increasing their debt levels, you can adjust the beta by using this formula.
I can first unlever the beta and then relever it based on the new DDE ratio. So I also want to talk about another beta, or another way of calculating a beta for an individual firm. All right, now the, the reason why we're going to do that is regression betas, the ones we calculated by taking that data and, and getting the best fit line, they're notoriously unstable. In other words, if you look at the beta year to year, it might change from 0.2 to 0.5 to, to, to 1. And they also have uh, notoriously low R squareds. You know, it just, uh, the, the, the market doesn't explain that much of the variation in returns. An alternative to using an individual stock beta is to use an industry beta by taking the uh, average returns of the entire industry compared to the stock market and use that as a measure of beta. The problem with that is that each individual firm has different debt to equity ratios. So it's hard to see exactly how your firm would be affected by their DD ratio, but we're gonna fix that in a minute. Now, if you go to your spreadsheet or click on this link right here, you'll have this industry beta tab. It's from DeModern at, at NYU, and he updates this data, I think every quarter, and it has unlevered beta for different industries. And if we look, and I just made a color code here, the green ones are really low betas and the red ones are really high betas. So if I look, the highest beta based on this data set is railroads. Some other high betas are software, semiconductors, retail online, real estate, office equipment, biotech, pharma, computers, peripherals, and chemicals. So see, these are some of the highest betas. So those are stocks that tend to do really well when the market's good and really poorly when the market's uh, down. Now the lowest betas, the safest stocks, let's look at some low ones here. Actually banks, broadcasting, brokers, financial services, home building, hospitals, hotels, power companies, very regulated, real estate investment trusts. So these are kind of portfolios of uh, real estate. Grocery and food, rubber and tires, utilities, general utilities and water utility. These are the safest industries in the world. Now these have actually calculated, these betas have already been adjusted for, or they've already been unlevered. So these are actually the levered betas for the industry, looking in column D. Column B shows the unlevered. So what, what uh, DeModeran's done for us is he's calculated the base, betas of the entire industry, and then he's divided by one plus the DDE ratio of the entire industry. So this would be the beta of the typical firm that has no debt in that industry. Now, if I think about Walmart, I would think Walmart is, is I looked at their revenues about half, the, a couple years ago I looked at this, about half the revenues come from food and the other half come from general retail. So if I wanted to calculate a beta for Walmart, I'd have to probably combine those two industries. So if I uh, go to my spreadsheet, or I'm sorry, go back to the PowerPoint. If you look in the file there, the grocery beta is about 0.28 or is the unlevered grocery beta is 0.28 and the unlevered general retail beta is 0.75. So if I wanted to come up with what, what is the average risk of a company that's half and half general retail and half grocery, I could just take the weighted average of those two. You know, Walmart's kind of in two industries, so that's why I'm doing this. And so Walmart, based on the risk of the entire industry, should have a beta of about 0.515. Since I'm using unlevered betas, this would be the beta of Walmart if they had average industry risk and they had zero debt. Now, how can I adjust this for the fact that Walmart's DD ratio is 66 over 340? Well, I can use that formula. I'll take my unlevered beta, I'll call that BU, and multiply times one plus the DD ratio of Walmart, and I get a 0.615 beta. I can then plug that 0.615 beta for Walmart into the CAPM formula and I can get a 564 uh, expected return or cost of equity 
or Walmart. Now these industry betas, personally, I prefer these because these are much more stable. Uh, however, if you're looking at companies that are thinking of adjusting their DD ratios or, or thinking or, or even just maturing to more average risk in the industry, um, this is going to be probably a preferred method. And for private companies that have no stock, you know, the stock doesn't trade on a stock exchange, so you can't get stock returns. Uh, this is the only way to get a beta. You just look at the average risk of the industry that the trick is trying to figure out what industry they're in. So if I go to my spreadsheet, I look at the Walmart WAC. I'm going to calculate the Walmart cost of equity. You can see here's my formula for my weighted average beta. I'll just take 0.5 of, I'm sorry, I can just take 0.50% of that beta of the grocery beta plus 50% of the retail beta, and that's my 0 0.5150. I got my market value of uh, equity. I got my market value of debt, or, de or the, I'm sorry, the net debt. I then calculate my DD ratio, 0.19. So I can get a levered beta for Walmart. Levered beta for Walmart would be my unlevered beta times one plus the DD ratio, 0.615. And then I can plug that into the CAPM formula. Walmart cost of equity would be the risk-free rate plus that levered beta times a market risk premium. And I just rounded it to 6% instead of using that 616. So there's my 564 CAPM cost of equity for Walmart. In the next topic, we're going to calculate the cost of debt and that will allow us to do the weighted average cost of capital.